Welcome to our first in a mini long series of videos for IV Biology. These videos are for the newest IV Biology curriculum with first exam starting in 2016 and I'll be sure to note that on uh, the description of the video. Uh, so this is our first first section here, Introduction to Cells, and this is section 1.1 for IV. And really in this video we're just looking at an introduction to cells and kind of starting to talk about some of the things that we see in cells, um, similarities that we see in all different types of cells and also a little bit of differences as well. Um, there's a couple of things that all cells have and the first is that they have some sort of membrane or a plasma membrane and this helps to create a uh, internal environment that can be different from something that's outside of the cell and as we get later on in the year we'll see how that this is really important. The second thing that all cells must have is some sort of genetic information uh, primarily obviously DNA and this can be arranged slightly different. Sometimes in more advanced cells, eukaryotic cells, the DNA will be enclosed within a nucleus. In prokaryotic cells, that DNA is just free-floating within the cell. Um, so it can be found in a little bit different locations, but all cells are going to have some genetic information. Cells also have the ability to carry out chemical reactions. As we'll see, this is really, really important, uh, especially, for example, like cells performing respiration, uh, aerobic respiration in order to produce ATP. That would be an example of a chemical reaction. They all have a cytoplasm and this is primarily a kind of jelly-like substance that is where those chemical reactions can oftentimes be taking place. They have ribosomes. Ribosomes are super important in allowing uh, proteins to be formed, location of where proteins are being formed. And lastly they have uh, their own energy release system. So they're able to produce some energy uh, just like you and I and other animals and organisms need energy in order to be able to do things, cells need energy in order to be able to do things so that we can actually do things. Cells are the smallest living structures and building blocks of life. So they are the smallest, most uh, smallest living things. Um, and we're going to take a look at a couple of different examples of um, some different cells here. Uh, the first would be a striated muscle fiber cell. And as we get into the cell theory and we start talking about the cell theory, these cells kind of go against or, or, or um, slightly or different than what you would expect to, to see in the cell theory. They're, they're kind of slightly different cells. Uh, but this first one, the striated muscle cell, is, is what, what it sounds like. It's a cell that is found in muscles and it's primarily used for movement. Um, your muscles in your body help you to move and these cells are the actual building blocks of those muscles that allow for movement. What's unique about these cells is they're much larger than other cells. Uh, they're about 30 millimeters in length and they can have several hundred nuclei. Uh, so they're, they're very different than a traditional single cell that's very small in size as we'll see in the lab and um, only have usually one nucleus. The second type of cell is a fungal hyphae and this is, um, is, is kind of like a cell that has this tube-like structure. Um, and it has, also has many nuclei. So you can kind of see in the image here we've got some, some tube-like structures and so it's a very different or unique uh, type of uh, cell shape. And the last is a giant algae. And these are simpler in structure and organization than plants. Um, they're the basis of many marine food chains and what's also really unique about these is that they can get really big. We'll talk about the size of cells a little bit as we progress throughout this unit. Um, but they can, these cells can get to lengths of 100 millimeters uh, with only a single nucleus. So that, that's really big for a typical single cell. So let's get into a little bit about cell theory um, and kind of how we started to understand about cells. One important theme that we'll continue to look at throughout our entire time together is as technology improves, we're able to make new discoveries. And so that's what's really cool about science and biology is we're making new discoveries all the time. And so an example of a new technological tool may be hard to believe now, but the development of the microscope was a really important tool in being able to analyze and look at cells and really gain an understanding and build an understanding of what's going on um, at a smaller level, a, a microscopic level. Um, and so the, the, the development of the microscope allowed for the discovery of cells. Uh, Robert Hooke was the first to use the term cell. Um, and he was is using microscopes to look at cork, like what you would maybe find in a uh, wine bottle. Uh, Leeuwenhoek, a nether scientist, um, officially the discoverer of cells, um, the first microbiologist and observed single-celled organisms. Um, and so these two individuals 
both use microscopes to be able to look at cells. Um, Leeuwenhoek kind of receives most of the credit for discovering cells, but it wasn't without the help and work of Hook um, to kind of begin this process. Now, you, this is probably not information new to you, but there's a couple of points um, that, that, that fit with the cell theory that make up the cell theory, and that is that all living things are made up of one or more cells. We already talked about how cells are the smallest building blocks of life, so all living things are made up of at least one, if not more, cells. Cells are the smallest unit of life, and cells come from pre-existing cells. And that last point is, is one that we'll take a look at in class and is an interesting one. And many scientists have done experiments to kind of examine this and to test this and what has now allowed it to become part of the cell theory. Um, Pasteur, who you've probably heard, heard the term pasteurize, oftentimes we will pasteurize our milk in order to kill off any bacteria that would make uh, potentially harm us um, that would be in the milk. So that process of pasteurization is, is, called, is essentially just killing off um, bacteria that would be found in milk uh, products. Pasteur was the scientist who was examining and looking at the spontaneous growth of life. And he did this by doing a couple of different experimental setups. Um, we will simulate this in class. But he took some different uh, containers and put broth, like chicken broth or beef broth, in these containers. And he set them up on a couple of different examples, one with an open top, a second with a uh, cork or uh, it being sealed. And then the last was uh, this container that had kind of a um, U-shaped neck where um, bacteria or particles or things couldn't just directly float straight down into the open top, um, but the, the, the bottle was still remained open. And what this experiment showed is that in order for life to grow, um, there had to be a nutrient, an energy source, uh, that was the broth, but then also it had to be able to, life had to be able to get into that, that container. And so in the open top, um, as a result, he saw bacteria growing and other things growing inside the broth. And the other two containers, both the closed and the U-shaped neck, there was no life that grew. So uh, that was a good way to examine and look at how cells must come from pre-existing cells. Life must come from pre-existing life. We're going to take a look at some single-celled organisms, and believe it or not, there are many single-celled organisms that are extremely important to uh, the survival of life on the planet. Um, all living organisms carry out some basic functions that are necessary for life, and those include nutrition, metabolism, growth, response, uh, often to stimuli, excretion, homeostasis, and reproduction. And these are all themes that we will continue to look at throughout the course of our time together. Um, you, uh, single cell organisms include usually prokaryotes, sometimes eukaryotes, protists, fungi, and bacteria are examples. And one cell type, one single cell organism in particular, is paramecium. Uh, these can often be found in pond water. Um, it has a nucleus. It often uh, does asexual reproduction, so it reproduces without sex. It has a cell membrane. It has a food vacuole where food is digested and nutrients are released into the cytoplasm. Uh, the metabolic reactions take place in the cytoplasm. It has a contractile vacuole, um, so another storage container that takes water in and then pushes it out, kind of like a, a very basic pump um, to help it move. And it also has cilia, small hair-like um, projections off of the outside of the cell. You can kind of just make them out along the outside here. And these are also used for movement. This is a living organism, believe it or not. It's very simple. Uh, it's very small. Um, but these can be found in uh, oftentimes pond water and make up a, a basic portion of um, a, a very important portion of the food web in, in pond uh, environments. The second uh, that we're going to look at, single celled organism, is something called Chlamydomonas. Um, and this is a unicellular algae that lives in the soil and also sometimes fresh water. Uh, the nucleus can divide by sexual or asexual reproduction. Metabolic reactions also take place in the cytoplasm, so we're really starting to see this theme here. It has a cell wall and membrane. One thing that distinguishes eukaryote cells and prokaryote cells is the presence of a cell wall in prokaryotes. Eukaryote plant cells have cell wall, but eukaryote animal cells do not. Um, it has also a contractile vacuole to hold water and to help ensure homeostasis. It helps to, uh, to ensure that 
remains correct pressure and, and balance with its external environment. It does perform photosynthesis, so it's able to produce its own energy. And it has a flagella, which you can see right here, that helps with movement. So a little bit longer than cilia, um, but that tail uh, helps, helps with movement. Another example of a flagella is what you would see in a sperm cell. We previously talked about the size of a cell, and there's an important balance or ratio between the surface area and volume of the cell. The rate at which a substance crosses a membrane depends on its surface area, and the rate of reactions is proportional to the volume of, of the cell. So, for example, if the ratio is too small, substances will not enter as quickly as waste needs to be removed, and obviously that would be a problem in removing and expelling waste from the cell. So there's a, a, a balance or a ratio, and in most, in most situations we see uh, consistent cell sizes. Prokaryotes are about 1 to 3 microns, uh, eukaryotic cells are a little bit bigger, 10 to 100 microns usually in size. And we'll look at cell sizes in class a little bit more, as well as cell uh, surface area and volume ratios. One thing that's really interesting is that cells have specialization. So a cell contains different parts, those cells put together um, can make tissue, tissue put together makes organs, organs put together make systems, which then goes on to make an, an organism. One thing that's really cool to think about though is that all cells have the same DNA. And so then the question is how do these cells become different? What causes them to become heart cells or liver cells or uh, skin cells? And the answer lies in genes. Genes in DNA control growth and development and help cells become specialized. This is really important and is a process that we'll look at more as we get into DNA and transcription translation. Um, but it's important to remember that cells are specialized. They perform different types of functions. This obviously is in multicellular organisms, not single cell organisms. And they become specialized or differentiated by expression of their genes, sections of the DNA responsible for a specific characteristic or trait. Um, this results in producing cells that are specific in their structure and their function. This is something else that we'll look at, how the structure of a cell is often related to its function. And then cells organized into tissues and organs in a specific arrangement. Um, humans actually have about 220 distinctively different specialized cell types. Um, and all cells, as I mentioned previously, have the exact same DNA, given a mutation here or there. Stem cells is also a topic in this uh, section for 1.1, and we're going to take a closer look at stem cells and discuss them in class because there's a whole host of information available and all kinds of new discoveries are being made available uh, just uh, pretty much it seems like every month, every year, there's all kinds of new discoveries being made. So we'll take a closer look at stem cells in class together. This has been IV Bio 1.1.